So what I want to do is talk about the appellate courts, okay? I want to go on ahead and start there, and, and then we'll talk about trial courts, all right? Remember that in our system in Texas, we have two kinds of courts, appellate and trial. Trial courts are what we call courts of original jurisdiction, and we talked about that a little bit yesterday. What does it mean to have a court of original jurisdiction, anybody? Court of original jurisdiction. Okay, and what happens in a court of original jurisdiction? That's correct. So you're going to present your evidence, you're going to have, what are the unique things about a court of original jurisdiction? You have a trial, you also have, okay, but what else? What does a trial involve? You've seen Law and Order enough times to know. <laughs> dun dun. <laughs> huh? Okay, you have a plaintiff and a defendant. Good. What else? Because in an in a, a appeals case, you have a petitioner and a respondent. Okay, what else? Okay. And what is it about that trial court, that court of original jurisdiction, that's going to be unique? The case itself involves presentation of evidence. Only in a, in a court of original jurisdiction may you present witnesses, evidence, uh, cross-examination, direct examination, all of those things that you and I think about happening in a court. You know, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. You know, isn't it true that on the night of, all of those things that we think about as far as court happen where? At the trial court level or the court of original jurisdiction, which is where your case starts. Once you get past that level, then the, the appellate courts kick in and the appellate system is going to look at what? What are they concerned about? They're going to look at facts of law, procedure. Are they going to hear any new testimony or witnesses? Can you bring in a witness who, who could say, he didn't do it, I, could, I, I was there, I'm his alibi. Trial de novo. That's right. They would have to order a new trial for new evidence to be presented. That is absolutely correct. Very good. So what, that's the reason that when we talked about JP court, we said that if you go up and appeal, you can't really appeal. What do you ask for? You ask for another trial, a trial de novo. And where would that happen? In the county court in the county court, right? County court at law. Okay, now, so appeals courts will, will not hear new testimony. They hear arguments. Those arguments are timed. You have three little lights, red, yellow, green. Green says talk, yellow says you're running out of time. Red says stop, that's it. Um, usually it's about an hour. Okay, so original jurisdiction, trial courts, that's where the action is, so to speak, that you and I usually think about. Because to be honest with you, appellate courts are pretty boring. They're more like a debate. So the things that happen in an appellate court are you're going to need the transcript, you're going to need your arguments of law, which are written and oral. The written arguments are given to the court in the form of briefs, okay? The oral arguments are limited in terms of time. And you don't call witnesses, all right? What you're going to do is simply argue the case, all right? Um, the, there are two levels of appellate court the intermediate and the supreme. 
Texas has two supreme levels, uh, or two supreme courts, a court of criminal appeals and a court, uh, a supreme court. All right, so jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is the ability of a court to hear a case in terms of um, both the topic of the case and the plaintiff and the defendant, the, the subjects of the case. Uh, I can't hear a case in El Paso that regards a traffic stop in Dallas, right? If I'm going to file a, for a divorce and I've been living in El Paso, I would have to file in El Paso, all right? Now, usually what happens is that at the intermediate level, you, your, your court is going to hear cases in groups of three judges, three judges. If they hear the whole, if everybody in the court sits together, that's called sitting on bunk, okay? Uh, appellate judges are elected to six-year terms and they have to run in partisan elections. This is one of the criticisms of judges. Why would we want to elect a judge who's running on a partisan platform? <laughs> Aren't judges supposed to be fair and impartial? Okay. So all appellate judges are elected and they run for six year terms and they're partisan. Now, the good news about it is you know how the guy stands. If he says he's a Republican, you know that if he gets a case involving, an appellate case involving uh, abortion, he's probably not going to uh, find in favor of, of an abortion clinic, right? Okay. Um, you have to be 35 years old, you have to have practiced law or served as a judge for more than 10 years. I would argue that most of us do not understand the backgrounds of the people that we see on the ballots, and so sometimes that becomes a problem. Or we vote in a partisan manner, the R or the D, and we don't realize what we're voting for. And this is another argument about judges in Texas is, we really don't know what we're going to get. Okay, we just see the, the R or the D next to the guy's name and oftentimes they're running unopposed. Um, have you, how many of you have seen the number of unopposed judicial positions are on most ballots when we have judicial, look, look in uh, March uh, as you go into the primaries um, and then look again in the general election in November of next year and watch what I'm telling you. A lot of them run unopposed. Okay. Um, so, we'll get into some of those other arguments about uh, criticisms in a little bit. Now, your intermediate court of appeal will hear all appeals from the county and district courts except for death penalty cases. Where do death penalty cases go automatically? Supreme. Okay. That's why they have to sit in, in banks of three judges. They have to sit in banks of three judges because they're going to hear so many cases. Um, they review the transcript of the lower court, they review the, the briefs, which are the written arguments, and then they listen to the arguments themselves, the oral arguments. They determine if the trial judge followed the law or violated any rules. For example, did he disallow evidence or allow evidence that shouldn't have been allowed into court? Did he misinterpret the law? Did he sustain or, or deny an objection, overrule an objection that should have been considered? Um, judges uh, uh, and attorneys know the procedure, all right? Like whenever the defense rests, whenever the defense rests in a, in a criminal case, they will always ask the judge for an immediate decision and, and the judge will 99% of the time say your, your, your um, request is overruled, it's denied. Why do they do it? Because they want it on the transcript. Okay, so why do, judge, why do attorneys go, I object, okay? And it seems like it's very um, uh, contentious between these guys, but in reality, at the end of the day, they probably get together and have a beer. All right, uh, I, when I went to court last week, the, the prosecutor and the defense attorney 
are so close, uh, working together, you know, they're best friends. Certainly. Okay? Yeah, uh, how are we going to handle this one? Yeah, I think we're going to ask for continuance. How do you feel about that? Well, I really don't think a continuance is going to be appropriate, so we're going to have to talk to the judge. And they're going back and forth. The two of them came to me. I was called as a witness for the defense, even though I was the one who said the guy did what he did. I was called as a witness for the defense, but it was the prosecutor and the defense attorney that both came to me and said, what do you think before the case? was even called up. Okay? Now, um, in reality, that's probably not going to happen too often. When you have a witness, they try to keep in, in real, I mean, really serious court cases, you're going to sequester your witnesses. What does that mean? You want to keep your witnesses isolated. In the Trayvon Martin case, Trayvon Martin's own parents had to have special permission to sit in that courtroom. And, um, uh, Zimmerman's parents could not sit in the courtroom until after they testified. Do you understand why? Not only that, you can't be talking about the case. When you discuss anything about the case outside of the presence of the jury, that's called ex parte. And there's some really weird uh, rules with regards to ex parte. I discovered in, that in, in El Paso, the police will not enforce ex parte orders from the judge for, uh, uh, for civil, um, or what do you call them, restraining orders. Not really a restraining order, a protective order. An ex parte protective order will not be enforced by the police. So if you're in the process of getting a divorce and you, you've been abused by your spouse and you got a protective order or the police took out a protective order and it says this person's not supposed to be within 600 feet of you and they drive by or they show up or whatever, I found out this the hard way, until you've actually gone in front of the judge, both parties, and, he's, and he or she has heard arguments, even though they issued the, res the temporary order, it's called ex parte. And so they will not enforce an ex parte protective order. That's correct. So you better hope you get in front of that judge real fast. Yes, or their attorney. So here's the way it works on a protective order, okay? The police can on their own issue the protective order even if you don't want them to, or you go in front of the judge and you ask for the protective order. I know, I went through this the hard way. So I ask for the protective order and I get the protective order for myself and for my child. My wife shows up, uh, calls me up and says, I'm coming over to the house, I wanna see our daughter. And I said, you can't come over to the house, there's a protective order. So she shows up, so I call the police. So they show up. In fact, she showed up and took my car and left her car. And they said, nope, she didn't steal your car. I said, but I have an order that says that that car is supposed to be with me. And they said, hasn't gone to court yet. So the order was worth the paper. It wasn't even worth the paper it was printed on. So anyway, I found out that it wasn't until after we had gone in front of the judge that they could actually enforce the protective order. And restraining orders are even more difficult. So if you get a restraining order, not much you can do because the police will not enforce them. Yeah. How many of y'all knew that? Yeah. I found out, out the hard way. So I had like three cops that show up to the house and they're like, I'm sorry. And I showed them the orders and they said, but this is an ex parte order. We can't enforce an ex parte order. I said, well, why do I have it? And they said, well, so that you can justify yourself when you go in front of the judge. Yeah, but the thing about it is, what happens if your spouse, you know, what happens if your spouse shows up and beats the crap out of you again because you got the protective order? Really, seriously, the police in El Paso will not enforce an ex parte order. Um, I think it's up to the jurisdiction. So in El Paso, they will not do it. I don't know. I don't think so. Huh? 
yeah, so I would probably assume that they wouldn't. Now, this was several years ago. They might have changed the policy, but at that point they said, no, they were not going to enforce ex parte protective orders. But it seems to me that's pretty dangerous, right? It seems to me, if you have a protective order, that's supposed to be really enforced in violet because that's supposed to keep you protected, right? It's supposed to keep you safe and your children. Well, I found that out the hard way. Okay, anyway, um, so ex parte communication means discussion between the parties outside of court. Now, do the attorneys get together and discuss these things? Yes, they do before they ever walk in. But what's supposed to happen is the witnesses aren't supposed to talk to each other and the plaintiff and defendant are not supposed to communicate. You can't communicate with the judge, so on and so forth. That's called ex parte, okay? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if someone is speaking by your attorney is on a uh, communication level that uh, it's almost somewhat of a misdemeanor, they do it uh, Well, that's how you end up with a lot of plea bargains, right? right. What are you offering? Oh, I'm, I'll give them, uh, if you'll plead guilty to uh, uh, a class uh, C felony, then I'll give him uh, six months and uh, time served and probation. And it's like, yes, but you do realize, okay, then the attorney will say, take, take the plea. And you're like, but I really didn't do it. And he'll say, look, take the plea because otherwise you're, you're risking 10 years. And so are there people that confess to doing things that they didn't do? They, they, I mean, there are people that claim this all the time, right? And when you plead, what's going to happen is you lose your right to, to ask for an appeal. You waive that right. So if you are involved with the justice system, they offer you a plea, really think it through, <laughs> okay? If you really didn't do it, you really, really, really didn't do it, then you really have to think it through. But there are people that get really pressured into like taking plea deals that, okay. So um, chat, uh, it points out that Texas has a dual Supreme Court system. The Supreme Court hears cases that are civil in nature and the Court of Criminal Appeals uh, here's cases that are criminal in nature. There is an exception from the legal standpoint. Juveniles are considered, okay, are considered to be part of the civil court system. And so in cases of juvenile offenses, they do not go through the criminal system. They are adjudicated. They are not convicted. They are detained, not arrested. Okay, they are placed into custody, they are not imprisoned. All right, so the state's highest appellate court for hearing criminal cases for juveniles is Texas Supreme Court. I guarantee you this is going to be on the test. I think I've gone over this a lot of times already, right? Okay, so understand that. Most people do not understand that. All right, so most cases at the, at, the dual, at the Supreme Court level, either in the Court of Criminal Appeals or the Supreme Court, they are heard in bonk, all nine members together, in bonk. They are, uh, these justices are elected in partisan statewide elections and they serve six year staggered terms. The Supreme Court issues licenses to practice law, which are established by the Board of Law. Who gives the test? the bar. And that's the reason that even though the bar is actually a professional special interest group, they're actually a part of the law. They're actually a part of the government. They recommend to the Supreme Court that you be licensed. They can also recommend to the Supreme Court that your license be revoked or suspended. The, in other words, attorneys police themselves. Okay? Doctors don't do that. Well, in a way they do, but really they serve on boards at the, and, and those are governmental agencies. But the Bar Association is incredibly important and very different 
in that it is both a special interest and a part of the governmental system. Very unique. And that happens pretty much every state. Okay. Also, the Supreme Court establishes procedural rules and overstates the judicial, oversees the judicial system. So the Supreme Court will establish what the rules are going to be as far as um, what testimony is heard, when, how, what can't be heard, what, what's excluded, what's included, uh, all of those things. And the attorneys have to understand each and every one of those situations. So uh, in the case I just told you about, in the divorce case, um, my attorney called doctors uh, who had been treating my wife. Her attorney objected because they said it was medical testimony and therefore was uh, restricted. My attorney said, yes, but under rule so-and-so, so-and-so, subsection such-and-such, it says that there can be an exception when um, a minor is involved and you're talking about the security of a minor. And so that she, the judge said, I agree, and I'm going to let one doctor testify. And so she uh, had to give an exception. So they're going back and forth. I have no idea under rule 2307 such and such and they're going back and forth over the law. I would never know that stuff. Okay, but that's what attorneys have to know and think of right then and there because they need to know what makes an attorney valuable to you? Why do you spend 300, 400 bucks an hour on an attorney? Because they know the rules of the game. And if you know the rules of the game, you can rig the game any way you want to, right? That's the beautiful thing about being an attorney. <laughs> All right. It's also why the old joke about what's a thousand attorneys at the bottom of the ocean, a good start, but um, pump. That, that's why we think of attorneys in, in such negative terms sometimes. But boy, I tell you what, when you need one, they sure do. Okay? When you're, when you're sitting in jail and you're going to have to pick up that phone, all right, you're going to, yeah, they come in handy, right? Right? Okay. Um, judicial activism. That is um, the idea that the court somehow promotes policy from the bench or makes law from the bench. Um, I have often found that the winners are going to say that the judge was fair and constructivist and the losers will always blame an appellate judge of judicial activism. Okay? So judicial activism is the idea that the judge is making policy from the bench. Constructivism is the idea that the judge is following the law to the letter. Critics say that court-related policies or created policies are unconstitutional because the policies were not made via a democratic legislative action. Proponents say the courts have a responsibility to protect the interests of all sides, even the minority interests. So the idea is that the court has to uh, speak for those who can't speak for themselves. Um, James Madison argued very early on in, our, in, in the establishment of the Constitution that you had to protect against the tyranny of the majority. Just because everybody says we should do it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's being treated fairly. Majority doesn't always rule, does it? That's what distinguishes between a republic and a democracy. If we were a democracy, we'd raise our hands, and if more people raise their hands than not, then you do it, okay? But we are a republic, and so in a republic, we try to protect everybody's interests. That's very difficult. So the courts, when they make some of these rulings, not everybody's going to agree. Many are not going to agree, okay? And so the ones that, that tend to be on the losing side will call the court uh, activist, and those that are on the winning side will call the court constructivist. Okay? Uh, that's another hint that you might see something on your test with regards to what's the difference between judicial activism and judicial constructivism, right? Okay? Do we understand that? Because it's a great essay question, I tell you. Um, haven't made the test yet, but I'm, I'm telling you it's a good essay question. Um, Texas is one of only seven states that require its judges to run in partisan elections. This is one of the biggest beefs I have with the judicial system in Texas. I do not agree with it. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Yep. Yeah. In fact, I'll give you an exam review a couple of days before the test, like Wednesday of next week, okay? In fact, I, I probably will put it out to you guys at the beginning of next week and do it this weekend. So if you're asking, are we going to have an exam review, the answer to that is yes. Okay? Um, now, there are two reasons why uh, in the 1877 Constitution we decided to go this route. People wanted to have superiority over the government, not the government over the people, so they did not like an appointment-based system, and uh, they want to know what the judge stands for ahead of time. The only problem is that forces the judge into a corner because the judge has to say, I am a Republican or I am a Democrat, and people expect, it's a brand that you give yourself, right? And I think when we talked about uh, political parties early on, I said, um, you, you certainly don't want to buy a bag of Oreos and find out there's cho uh, that there's Chips Ahoy inside. That would disappoint you, right? Right? Okay, well, yes, but is that what you bought? Is that, you, you, you picked the Oreos and you have an expectation of what's going to be inside the package. Now, when you put that kind of expectation on a judge, judges are supposed to be fair and impartial and base their decisions on the law. So a judge may make a, make, may make a Chips Ahoy decision, but he came in the Oreo package. So should we be angry with the judge because he made the Chips Ahoy decision and he's declaring himself to be an Oreo? All right, I, I'm trying to make this easy to understand, but that's what partisan politics is all about, right? When we see that R or that D, we have expectations about certain things, especially with hot button issues, education, um, especially things like abortion and Roe v. Wade, uh, especially with regard to states' rights uh, or welfare cases or uh, things like that social, promoting social policy. We have expectations. So um, a good attorney, a good judge should be saying, look, I'm going to rule by the law. Do you all know who Sonia Sotomayor is? Yeah, she's one of our Supreme Court justices appointed by Obama. She was uh, first Hispanic female, first Hispanic. She's Puerto Rican, she's from, um, she is from uh, New York. And uh, there was a clandestine recording that, she, that was made of her having this discussion with a group of law students and she said, basically she confessed that judges make policy from the bench, but she says, but I'm not supposed to tell you that because judges are not supposed to make policy from the bench, but we all know that it happens. Well, guess what? When she's being confirmed by the Senate at the, uh, to the Supreme Court, they're asking her about this. And, they, and the Republicans are pushing against her and the Democrats are pushing for her. Her argument was, listen, I have to hear cases on the basis of the facts presented. And so, if you are expecting me to tell you I'm going to vote this way ahead of time, because they were, I'm not going to say it. I refuse to tell you. I can't tip my hand. Because if I do, then what I'm, I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm confessing to you that indeed I have an agenda. And if I have an agenda, don't vote for me. Do you believe that to be a good response to the... Because believe me, the Republicans put her over the coals. Okay? And remember, at the federal level, judges are appointed. At the state level, here in Texas, they're elected and they're partisan. And that's, to me, I, I, don't, I don't agree with it. I, I think it's wrong. But others in Texas would say, by gum, I want to have the ability to choose who's going to be my judge. Well, do you really understand all of the intricacies involved in selecting a judge? Are any of us in this room qualified to understand how good or bad a judge is going to be. There's a lot of people that would argue that. Uh, there are other people that argue that it should start with an appointment and then every six years you should go back up for a vote of confidence. But again, that vote of confidence means you're going to have to 
basically, hopefully you run on your record. But when you have a partisan election, the other thing you have to do is get people to support you, financially and otherwise. Because that means you depend on the party. It's a, a real tough go here. I personally do not believe in it. Okay, so the initial belief is that the uh, elected judiciary is more responsive to the public rather than to full-time politicians and special interests. I disagree. Because to run for an elected, uh, uh, elected position, you must be responsive to the party, to your backers, right? Remember the phrase I gave you? You dance with the ones that brung you, right? Okay, which is an old country way of saying, if you paid my way to get here, I owe you something. All right? And that shouldn't be for a judge, should it? Okay. Now, the framers of the Constitution established a system of election where the law, uh, uh, it was supposed to curtail the powers of a government. We did not want an emperor leading up our state. So it was supposed to be a restriction on the, on the executive branch because we wanted to restrict the executive branch. So this goes back to the idea that we have this plural executive and we distribute the powers. Um, in terms of appointments, a lot of judges start out appointed. Uh, most judges that are sitting at the bench and run for re-election get re-elected even most of the time without any opposition. It's very rare that you see judges even have an opponent. It's only when it's a new position that you will see opponents for a judge. Because um, most judges are just automatically re-elected re without, um, without any opposition. They run unopposed many, many times. So it's only when the governor, uh, the, the governor's opportunity to get involved here is when he appoints someone to replace a judge who either died or left the bench. Right? Okay. Now, judicial appointment has significantly increased the number of women and minorities sitting on the bench in Texas. Uh, because otherwise, we tend to vote very traditionally, and that usually is an older white male. Statewide campaigns cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, and because they have less name recognition, the challenges are often must raise even more. And this is another reason why elected judges is not necessarily a good idea, because you got to dance with the one that brung you, right? Allegations of improprieties have tainted the system. Just look at Justice uh, Judge Barasa, who hadn't even been on the, gen the, the bench three months a few years ago. Do y'all know about him? This guy gets elected. And he's a real sleazeball. <laughs> he's exchanging judicial favors for sexual acts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because who of us knew this guy? But every, ju every attorney I've ever talked to told me, we knew this guy was a sleaze bucket the minute he started running. But he won. And within three months, he was behind bars and, okay? All right. So this is the Texas uh, Supreme Court. Do you think the judges should be appointed for life like they are at the federal system? Okay, what kind of a system would you think would be better? First of all, should they be elected? Appointment and then re-election on the basis of a vote of confidence. Because when, during the re-election, you're not going to, you're gonna run mostly on your record, right? Okay. So you basically, you'd be running on a post, but you'd go up for a vote of confidence, right? Okay. And that's the way it is in a lot of states, but I have talked to attorneys here, and rather, they, I, I would have to say they're, they're conservative attorneys, 
and I had this discussion and one of them told me that he had come over from, from uh, Colorado where they do this and he did not like that system at all. Okay. So, huh? Then the governor appoints a new, an, another person. Yes. You wouldn't have opposition. You just go up for a vote of confidence. A vote of continuance. Should this person continue on? No, we elect. For the Supreme Court of Texas, we elect. And if you've got the money, you can get elected. As long as you have 10 years of experience as an attorney, you don't even have to have been a judge. And most of us wouldn't know what kind of experience. So the next time you see someone running for judge, you better ask yourself, what, what qualifications does this guy bring? Or girl, whichever the case may be. All right, um, judicial reform. There's been a lot of call for a judicial reform. Uh, one, it would be that at the Supreme Court level, we should have single member districting, which would mean what? Your nine justices would each, each justice would represent a geographic area. Okay, again, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because it seems to me the judges, would, the justices would, shall we say, jockey to protect their geographic area, their constituency, right? And so, Again, should it be on the qualifications that you have as a judge, or should it be that you represent a geographic area? I can understand that. Now, they have the Missouri, Missouri plan, which combines judicial appointment with the power of voters to remove, and that's the one I'm talking about. So you get voted, you, you, you get appointed, and then every so many years, they have to reaffirm you. But you're not running in a partisan election. You're just running on your record. Um, going back to a single Supreme Court, not having the two courts separate, the dual court system that we have at the highest level. What do you all think about that idea? Uh, going back to one single Supreme Court that hears both criminal and civil cases. We don't track them. Do you like the dual court system? We don't have that at the federal level. It does. It also streamlines the process because you have nine justices that are going to deal with criminal cases and they're specialized in that area and nine justices that will deal with civil cases and juvenile cases and they're specialized in that area. Um, legislative appointment of trial judges. How about the legislature appointing a trial judge, not the governor? Would that circumvent some of the concerns that we had when we created the Constitution? Yes. That would. How about nonpartisan elections? We don't know whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. You run on your record alone. You're still going to have to raise money, and you're still going to have to dance with the ones that brung you. Right? How about getting rid of straight ticket voting? not letting you just walk up and push on the donkey or the, the elephant. And most strict ta straight ticket voters in Texas, are they voting Democrat or Republican? Okay, but the Republicans have for years said El Paso was a bastion of straight ticket voting. Do you know where the most straight ticket voting happens? It's in Midland, Odessa. And I guarantee you they're not voting Democrat. Okay.